the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus Christ. The so, beloved, if we read Genesis, it says that Adam's life was 930 years long, and then it says he died. Holy tradition tells us that his wife Eve lived for 950 years, so she lived 20 years longer than Adam, and then she died. And what did our first mother see? She lived long enough to see that she was the mother of all who lived upon the earth, with the exception of Adam and herself. However, she lived long enough also to see death. She saw her son Abel die. She saw her husband die. The Bible talks about Lamech, who committed murders or killed someone. And so she saw death, and the death was the fruit of her sin. She ate first, she gave the tree to Adam to eat, and Adam partook, and he also died. And so Eve dies after 950 years, and her death is a sorrowful one. It's filled with sorrow, because she knows that all who live upon the earth will die. And it's all from her. And she grieves over this. And not only that, she knows that she's not going to a nice place. She's going to the pit, what David calls the pit, this awful place, this place of death, this abode where all the souls go. And she's going there. So she's not going back to paradise. She lost it. She's going down to this awful place called the pit where her husband has already gone and so has Abel the righteous, and she will go there too. And all of her children will go to this place because of God's just judgment of her sin. She has hope because God has promised a Messiah. God said that God said to Satan, he said, I'll put enmity between thee, talking to Satan, and the woman, that's Eve, between thy seed and her seed. He shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. This is what the Hebrew and the Greek say. The Latin of the Old Testament is interesting because it says different. It actually says, she shall bruise thy head, and she, she shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise her heel, which is different. I think this, this reading is not the most accurate one, but it's interesting because the first two readings speak about Christ as the one who oppressed Satan, whereas the Latin with the feminine article implies the Virgin Mary will be the one who fights Satan and harms him through Christ. In any case, Eve has this distant promise, but she fears death. It's an agony, it's a pain, it's a horror. Hezekiah is this holy king. He's one of the best kings, right? Not as good as David, but he's a good king. And God says he followed in the ways of David for the most part. He made a few mistakes, but he was pretty good. And Hezekiah reaches this point in his life where it's revealed to him that he will die. He's very sick and he's going to die. And Hezekiah turns his face against the wall in his bedroom and he cries. And he says, oh God, save me. Save me, oh God. But why would he say that if he's a faithful man? Of course, he's going to the pit. He's going down to the grave where no one prays in that awful place. And Hezekiah is terrified. Even though he's righteous, he's terrified. And he begs God. And Isaiah, as he's leaving the palace, the word of God comes to Isaiah and he says, go back and tell Hezekiah he'll live for another 15 years because of his prayer. I've heard him and I'll give him more, I'll give him more life. So Eve's case is terrible. And not only that, with Eve comes a new era, the era of death. In fact, Eve is the last person to know paradise. Adam has died. She's the last person to walk in paradise. Paradise has died for all it means. Right? The last one who lived in paradise has left us. And now we are bereft of paradise. And so this new era has come. And this era of pain and sorrow and fear will remain until the coming of the second Eve. Today the deacon reads this gospel passage, which he reads for every time we celebrate the Mother of God, this passage from Luke, where it talks about Martha and Mary. Of course, the Mary that it's speaking of there is not the Theotokos, it's the sister of Martha. But this verse about Mary at Jesus' feet is perfect, because that's how the Mother of God spent her whole life. And St. Theophon the Reckless, when he talks about the Dormition, he talks about her whole life. The Dormition is the fruit of her whole life. The Most Holy Mother of God spent her whole life at God's feet and then at the feet of her Son. And it always says through the Gospels that, that Mary would treasure things up in her heart, that she would see something or hear something or some revelation be given to her and she would treasure it in her heart. So her heart became this treasury of knowledge, this treasury of divine understanding. And she was quiet. She wasn't busy like Martha. She worked, but she wasn't busy-minded as Martha was, not full of anxiety. She lived in confidence. She lived in this deep faith with God. And she became the mother of the Christ, the mother of God himself. And she never committed any willful sins, is what holy tradition teaches us. She never consented to sin. She was born with the sins of Adam, as in she fell prey to human nature. But she never made bad choices. Her choices were always with God. 
and she was helped by his grace, and she walked in this wonderful way. And so when it came time for her to repose, her repose was very different, very different than the first Eve's. In fact, it's so different that we don't even use the term death to describe it. We have this word dormition, which means falling asleep. St. John of Francia talks about this. He says that if we study Christianity, Christians don't like this term death anymore. If we read the New Testament, Stephen is stoned, but Paul, but Luke, the author, doesn't say he died. It says, and he fell asleep. Even if stones are hitting him and his blood is spraying up, he falls asleep. Because death is Hades. That's what death really is. Death is to go to this awful place called Hades, where you will be there for thousands of years. Who knows? Until the Christ comes, you'll be there. Adam was there until Christ came. Until Christ went down to Hades, he was in Hades, rotting in that awful place. Abraham went there. Noah went there. Moses went there. All the righteous went there. The only two who didn't were Enoch and Elijah. They didn't go there. But everyone else went to this awful place, maybe to better parts of it, but they went to an awful place. What Paul and Luke and the Christians are saying is they're saying, this is no more. Hades is still there, but you have to choose to go there. No one needs to go to Hades anymore. No one has to. No one has to go to that awful place where God's name cannot be pronounced. You don't have to go there. You can go to another place. And so St. John says, what is death to the Christian? Death is just translation. It's just movement from this reality to the reality of paradise. That's all death is. And so the mother of God falls asleep, and she's translated. She's translated. And St. John says, the Theotokos models everything for everyone, right? She models the life that Christians should lead. She models the peaceful repose, right? We pray for this during the liturgy. We want a peaceful death, a peaceful repose. And she models the resurrection. Because what happens with Christ happens with her. To the Christian, there is no death anymore. There's just translation. And Hades is for those who reject Christ and don't want his commandments and don't want to keep them. They can go to Hades. That's up to them. And the Christians have so much baldness that what does Paul say in Philippians? He says, for to me... To live is Christ, and to die is gain. That's interesting. So he says, I can live with Christ if I'm alive. If I die, I gain profit. Interesting. Paul says, I live with Christ now in this world, and I live for your sake, my flock. But if I die, I go straight to Christ. And so for me, death is actually better. But for, for, but for life, but for my life, it's better for you. That's what he says. This is so much confidence Paul has. And that death for him is gain. He actually wants it, especially after all the struggles that he's had. So he almost runs the race. Runs the race towards what? Towards the translation. He wants to be translated. St. Luke of Crimea says, Who had a death at the Theotokos? No one. No one does. Three days before the Theotokos was to repose, she would go up to the Mount of Olives where Christ ascended. She loved to go there. She'd walk around the place that Jesus was lifted up to heaven, and she would pray to her son, and she would walk around in the quiet, meditating and praying. And three days before her repose, the Archangel Gabriel came down with this branch, this luminous branch from heaven, like from a heavenly tree. Think about Noah and the ark, right? The dove flies back with this twig in her beak and gives it to Noah, saying, you may come now, you may come out. And so Gabriel comes with this branch in his hand, this radiating branch, and he says, in three days, your son will come to take you back to paradise. And so she returns, and she prepares herself. And her death is like bliss. It is so peaceful, it's like sleep, truly. She fell asleep. No pain, no fear. She just fell asleep. Because her trust was completely in her son. Completely. And when she dies, her son comes down with all the hosts of heaven, all of them, all the angels, all the prophets, all the righteous who have already been taken out of Hades by Christ. They come down. And Christ literally takes her soul out of her body. At the moment her soul leaves her body, he takes it into his hands. That's what the icon shows. He's holding her soul in his hands. And then he takes up to heaven. And three days later he comes down and takes her body up to heaven also that he may confirm the resurrection. And what's more, heaven has ascended to heaven, right? The womb of the virgin is heaven. Wherever God is, that is heaven. And her womb is heaven. So therefore heaven cannot be left on earth. Heaven has to go up to heaven. That's where it belongs. And so her body is taken up to heaven and she signifies the place that all the righteous will go. So if you live the life of the Theotokos, if you live like her, you'll go up there and you'll have a death that is peaceful. A death that is blessed. Even the martyrs had peaceful deaths, though there was violence. But their soul had peace because they knew they were going to Christ. And they were even full of joy. Beloved, think about the death of Eve. Again, think about living in the earth at that time and realizing that the last person who has seen paradise has died. And not only that, your mother, your great-grandmother, your great-great-great-great-grandmother, because she lived a long time, she's reposed. All of us have come from her womb, and she is dead. What does that mean for us? means death. However, 
In the case of the Virgin Mary, heaven has gone to heaven, and all Christians are full of hope. And the apostles grieve. Yeah, they grieve a little bit. They grieve temporally because their anger has gone. Their great support has left them. So their sorrow is just a kind of, a kind of, a kind of joyful pain in which they say, yes, she's gone to paradise, and we're joyful over this. We're sorrowful that our support has left us. But as they sit down to eat, they have two spaces open. They have one space for Christ, because after he left them, they always kept a table, a chair open for him, and they would set a plate before his place. And then when she left them, they set a place for her and left it open. And as they're sitting down to eat, the apostles are sad, because what are we going to do? The mother is not with us anymore. And all of a sudden, she appears to them, and she says, I have not left you, children. I have not. I'm in paradise with my son, but I'm also here with you. Right, the Lord gave the Theotokos to John, and he said, Mother, behold thy son, son, behold thy mother. And so therefore, the mother of God, though she has gone up, has not abandoned the world, as the Troparius says. See, when Eve died, did she give us anything? No, she gave us death. She gave us life, but then she gave us death. And she gave us the model of repentance, because Eve repented. We know this, she repented. So she repented in sorrow and died in sorrow. So maybe we can look at Eve and say, yes, we should repent in sorrow for our sins. But did Eve intercede for us? No. Who interceded in the Old Testament? They went down to Hades, that place of destruction where no one speaks of God anymore. So Eve didn't intercede for us. She didn't make intercession for us. She couldn't, even if she had wanted to. Right, the Virgin Mary has made intercession for us now, and she's become more powerful than she was on earth. And what she says is she says, children, I want you all to have the remission that I've had. Of course, no one will have that remission. But she wants us to have a peaceful repose. She wants us to leave this life in peace. She wants us to have a life that is righteous and holy and blameless. A life that is pure, she loves purity. A life that is good, so that when our death comes, we will have no shame, because we've repented already. We've sinned, the Mother of God didn't. We've sinned. And so when we die, we have to repent, so we won't have shame in that moment. If we don't have shame in that moment, we'll have strength. And we'll have boldness. We can say, Lord, I'm a sinner, but you've forgiven me. By your blood, you've forgiven me, and your mother has prayed for me, and I want to be with you. And the Most Holy Theotokos is so powerful that no one ever departs from her with empty hands. No one does. Because to do so would be, in a sense, to mock Christ. Christ made her the intercessor. He did. He made her this one. He said, you are the mother of the Christians. You are their mother now. And so, by doing this, he must listen to her. He must, and he does, always. The only people who depart from the Theotokos without their prayers answered are those who either ask amiss, or those who do not believe that they're going to get what they're asking for. They don't really want it. Right? Oh, Mother of God, help me. Okay, she didn't help me. I'm going to go off and do what I need to do. Right? There was no desire for real, for real prayer, for real faith in her. But if you come to her with real faith, she will not and cannot help but support you or give you something. So pray to her, beloved. Ask her to give you the remission that, she's, that she has had. Ask her for blessings. And she wants it more than you want it. She wants you to have a peaceful repose more than you could ever desire it. And she will labor to give it for you if you will labor to ask her. So let us ask the Theotokos that we will live the rest of our lives in purity, that we will repent, that we will lay aside our shame so that when we approach God, we will have no more shame. And we can say, Oh Lord, you brought me up to heaven by the prayers of your mother, and now I'm with you. May she be honored always, now and ever, and to the ages of ages. Amen.